Hello everyone. Welcome to another episode of Retina Roundup. I'm Dr. Minakshi Mahesh, fellow in Vitu Retina and Ocular Oncology. Let's review some of this month's interesting articles. The first article deals with outcomes of switching from proactive to reactive treatment after developing advanced central neovascular age-related macular degeneration. The treatment was switched from treat and extend to prorenata, injections of anti-VEGF after the patient developed macular atrophy or submacular fibrosis. Seven and nine percent of those who develop submacular fibrosis and macular atrophy were respectively switched to reactive treatment. Vision was stable at 12 months for all eyes with macular atrophy and inactive submacular fibrosis, whereas those with active submacular fibrosis who underwent the switch developed significant vision loss. No eyes that continued proactive treatment developed more than or equal to 15 letter loss, but 8% of all eyes that switched to a reactive regimen and 15% of eyes with active submacular fibrosis did. Hence, those stable outcomes can be expected after the switch. The risk of a significant loss of vision in eyes with active submacular fibrosis after the switch should be kept in mind. Moving on to article number two, the occurrence of retinal vasculitis or vascular occlusion after dolucizumab for neovascular AMD. 70 eyes with retinal vasculitis or vascular occlusion following dolucizumab were identified. The mean age group was 77.6 years and 77.8% of the patient were women. 45% received one dolucizumab injection before this incident occurred. Mean time to event from the last prolocizumab injection was 19.4 days, with 87.5% of events occurring within the first 30 days. 52.4% showed unchanged or improved vision from the last recorded pre-event assessment at latest follow-up, while 35.7% showed more than or equal to 15 letters visual activity reduction. Patients with no visual activity loss were on average slightly younger and had a higher proportion of non-occlusive events. Most retinal vasculitis or occlusion events reported after prolocizumab in early real-world practice occurred in women. Among eyes with visual activity measurements, approximately half experienced visual activity loss. Overall, about one-third had reduction of more than or equal to 0 0.30 logma at latest follow-up with indications of regional variations. Our next article is about nanofiber coated implants, development and safety after the intravitreal application in rabbits. Biodegradable nanofibers can modulate drug release, which allows the incorporation of fragile bioactive drugs. Nanofiber coated intravitreal implants of dexamethasone and vevacizumab, simultaneous injection of the drugs was used. Around 68% of dexamethasone was released in 35 days and 88% of vivacizumab in the first 48 hours. The formulation presented activity in the reduction of vessels and was safe to the retina. No clinical or histopathological change or alteration in the retinal function or thickness by ERG and OCT was noted in 28 days. Hence, these implants are in the pipeline to be considered as a safe drug delivery system for effective and safe treatment of AMD. Going forward, this article is regarding the function of lactate dehydrogenase A in retinal neurons and implications. The post-mitotic retina is highly metabolic and the photoreceptors depend on an aerobic glycolysis for an energy source and cellular anabolic activities. Lactate dehydrogenase A is a key enzyme in aerobic glycolysis which converts pyruvate to lactate. They noted a predominant expression of lactate dehydrogenase A in rods and cones and lactate dehydrogenase B in the RPE and molar cells. They went on to show the genetic ablation of LDHA in the retina resulted in diminished visual function, loss of structure, and loss of dorsal ventral pattern of the cone opsin gradient. LDHA loss also led to increased glucose act availability, activated oxidative phosphorylation, and upregulated the expression of glutamine synthetase, a neuron survival factor, whereas the absence of LDHA in molar cells did not affect visual function in mice. 
glucose shortage is associated with retinal diseases such as amd and regulating the levels of ldha may have therapeutic relevance here moving on to article 5 which highlights the recent work published from the primary retinal detachment outcome study group patients with primary regmatogenous retinal detachment who underwent surgical repair in 2015 were included data of 3000 eyes from six centers from us and 61 retinal surgeons were analyzed the importance of scleral buckling for phakic elderly patients and those with inferior breaks was reiterated 360 degree laser may result in poor visual outcomes and cme was commonly seen overall there was no major difference between the viewing systems the gauges of the sclerotomies buckles sutured versus not scleral tunnels drainage methods and techniques to address proliferated vitreoretinopathy all incisional techniques were found to be very cost effective treatment modalities for managing regmatogenous retinal detachment the next interesting article is based on the predictive value of pigment epithelial detachment markers in deciphering visual acuity in neovascular amd one i each of 159 patients with neovascular amd was studied polypoidal choroidal vasculopathy group included 77 eyes and non pcv group was 82 patients received convacept 0.05 ml in a 3 plus prorenata treatment regimen correlations between retinal morphological parameters at baseline and best corrected visual acuity gain at 3 or 12 months after treatment were assessed optical coherence tomography scans were used to assess retinal morphology features including intraretinal cystoid fluid subretinal fluid pd the types of pd vitromacular adhesion greatest height of pd and width of the pd along with the volume of pd at baseline were also measured for non pcv group the best corrected visual acuity gain from 3 or 12 months after treatment was negatively correlated with the volume of the pd at baseline best corrected visual acuity gain at 12 months after treatment is negatively correlated with the width of the pd at baseline for pcv group there was no correlation with volume height or width and type of the pd in vcv again between baseline and 3 or 12 months after treatment this was with a p value of more than 0.05 srf intraretinal cysts vitromacular adhesion at baseline did not correlate with short term and long term bcva gain in patients with neovascular amd hence for patients with non pcv the volume of the pd at baseline was negatively correlated with short term and long term bcva gain and the width of the pd was negatively correlated with long term bcva gain on the contrary quantitative morphological parameters for pd at baseline had no correlation with pcv again in patients with pcv our next article deals with the treatment of proliferative vitreoretinopathy this condition is usually surgically treated but numerous drugs and pharmacological methods have been proposed a structured literature review was conducted in the pubmed database to identify previously published agents proposed for medical treatment of pvr 36 substances that met the criteria of included toxicity and anti proliferative effects were evaluated on primary human retinal pigment epithelium using colorimetric viability assays the seven substances with the widest therapeutic range between toxicity and no longer detectable anti proliferative effect were then validated with a bromodeoxyuridine assay and a scratch wound healing assay using primary cells derived from surgically excised human pvr membranes among 36 substitutes 12 showed an effect on the pvr membranes 17 substances had a significant toxic effect of which 9 did not have any anti proliferative effect 15 substances significantly reduced the pvr proliferation the seven most promising drugs with the highest differences between toxicity and anti proliferative effects were dasatinib methotrexate resveratrol retinoic acid simvastatin tacrolimus and tranilast resveratrol simvastatin and tranilast additionally showed anti proliferative effects and dasatinib 
resveratrol and tranilast showed anti-migratory effects too. In conclusion, tesetinib, resveratrol, simvastatin, and tranilast seem to be promising and are hence well characterized for human use. Our last article deals with epiretinal amniotic membrane in complicated retinal detachment. It is a clinical and vitroretinal safety assessment. Amniotic membrane is a popular treatment for external ocular diseases. The intraocular implantation in other diseases reports promising results. Hence, they reviewed three cases of intravitreal epiretinal human amniotic membrane transplantation as an adjunct treatment for complicated retinal detachment and to analyze clinical safety. Possible cellular rejection reactions against the explanted amniotic membrane were evaluated and its influence was assessed on three retinal cell lines in vitro. The patients with complicated retinal detachment and implanted amniotic membrane during past pain of vitrectomy are retrospectively studied and after removal of the amniotic membrane at subsequent surgery, tissue-specific cellular responses were studied by light microscopy and immunohistochemical staining. They investigated the influence of amniotic membrane in vitro on retinal pigment epithelial cells. Despite the severity of the retinal detachment, stable clinical outcomes were obtained in all three cases. Immunostaining of the explanted amniotic membrane showed no evidence of cellular immunological rejection. In vitro, there was no statistically significant change in cell death or cell viability and no proliferative effects were detected. Hence, in conclusion, the amniotic membrane was a viable adjunct with many potential benefits for treatment of complicated retinal detachment. The investigations could not detect any signs of rejection, reactions, or toxicity. Further studies are also needed to evaluate this potential in more detail. That brings us to the end of this edition of Retina Roundup. Thank you for your patience listening.